God, come unto my assistance. Lord, make haste to help me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here. That you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins. And the grace to spend this time of prayer foodfully. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord. My God and angel, intercede for me. Hmm. And when they came to the place, hmm, which is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We begin our contemplation of the so-called seven last words of our Lord Jesus Christ. I purposely use the word contemplation rather than just consideration or even reflection. Because consideration is just any intellectual activity. Reflection is just a bit more intellectual activity still. But contemplation, contemplation is to look at with a loving gaze, the way a mother contemplates her baby, or a lover contemplates the beloved. Because that is what we should do in these sessions, which we have begun with the same formula that we normally use for making our mental prayer. We need to look with love at the scene so graphically depicted by the evangelists, not just to consider or even reflect, but to allow our heart to be moved and thereby allow our intellect as well to be enlightened. Enlightened by faith and inflamed by charity in order to fathom the depth of the words that our Lord spoke as he hung on the cross. Because if the Sermon on the Mount of chapters 5, 6, and 7 of St. Matthew constitute, as it were, a summary of the good news that our Lord announced his public life with, in the Last Supper, chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 of St. John would constitute something like a recapitulation of all that our Lord had said and done in the past months well the seven last words of our lord on the cross constitute his last will and testament so let's begin this pious practice with the first of those last words father forgive them for they know not what they do father oh jesus how good of you to start this dialogue by first addressing your father. By establishing the rules of engagement from the start. Because my brothers and sisters, unless something is founded on the reality of God's fatherhood and our divine sonship, our divine filiation, there is nothing worthwhile that we can really do. We can spend the entire session on this reality alone, that we're children of God. 
But that is only the first part of the verse. But how good it is to start on this note. Every prayer must be a dialogue of a child with his or her father and our Lord. In all the instances in the gospel that we see him pray, always starts with that single word, Abba, which is Hebrew for Papa, Daddy. It's a familiar word that Hebrew children use to address their father. And it is the way that we should address God with the confidence of a child, with the openness of a child. Father, forgive them. Because if paternity filiation is the fundamental relationship we have with God in the order of grace, since creator preacher is the order, is rather the fundamental relationship we have with him in the order of nature, where creatures is the creator, we can say that forgiveness is what specifies that relationship at the operational level. What does God do with us? He forgives us. And what is our relationship with God? Somebody to be forgiven. Somebody to be, in the words of St. Pope Francis, mercied. God created everything out of love. But in the case of the spiritual creatures, even with the foreknowledge that some of them would sin, even with that, he still created them with an eternal love, meaning to say unchanging love. Such a love is one of mercy. That's the love for an object which is in a state of moral inferiority. To love something lovable or someone lovable is natural. But to love something or someone, which at least on the surface is not lovable, that is mercy. And he loves us. God loves us, even in a state of sin. As somebody who has wronged him for going against his benevolence, a love that cannot change because of God's eternity. Shouldn't we learn from him to love our fellow men this way as well? To love somebody who is lovable is too human. To love somebody who is at, a, at least on the surface, unlovable, is akin to God's love. Now, sometimes I can't help but wish that the bearing and the Beatitudes had been different, where it says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And then there's another one that says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. But precisely because what characterizes God's love for us is mercy, sometimes I like to think right? it would have been nice if it said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be called children of God. How true it is to say, to err is human, to forgive divine. However, let's not stay at the level of nice sayings. Let us make this operative as God does with us. To really be forgiving. Quick to forgive. As St. Cousin Maria, the founder of Opus Dei, said in the way, point 452, force yourself, if necessary, always to forgive those who offend you. From the very first moment, for the greatest injury or offense that you can suffer from them is nothing compared with what God has pardoned you. Besides, didn't our Lord himself teach us the same principle when he taught us to end the Lord's Prayer with precisely this petition, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What a benevolent love our Lord's love is. Because of the three determinants of the morality of human acts to admit of benign interpretation, the moral object, the object of the act considered in itself, is quite often clearly observable and therefore can be judged objectively. The circumstances may not be that clear 
and definitely admit of benign or kind interpretation. However, the intention is totally internal to the agent and can definitely admit of a benign interpretation on the part of the observer. What we call the benefit of the doubt, we don't know what the person or why the person did what he did, what his aim was, what his purpose was, what his intention was. And because we don't know, then we just have to assume the best. Again, St. Cosa Maria also used to say, of the five or six different reasons why a person did what he did, why do you have to assume the worst? Assume the best, then you will seldom be wrong. Assume the best, because we don't know. And all this only if we have the duty to judge in the first place, because many times we don't even have a right to judge. So we shouldn't be judging. As our Lord said, judge not and you shall not be judged. But if ever we do need to judge, then let's be kind in our judgments. Let's be quick to forgive by giving the benefit of the doubt. And with that fundamental reason, as it were, because we too had offended our Lord. We too had been forgiven a lot. That even in the human plane, we too had made many mistakes and we had gotten away with it. So who are we to be so harsh in our judgments? Who are we to be so inflexible? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We, on the other hand, we know what we are doing. And we know that our Lord expects of us to be forgiving. As we ask him for the grace right now, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And our blessed mother, like any mother who always has benign eyes towards her children, would look at us with loving eyes as well, as, as she looks at the other children who she also forgives, expecting <clears throat> of us, her children, to be just as forgiving. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations that you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them to effect. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I beg your pardon for my sins and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel intercede for me. I would like to help you meditate among the seven words, the last words of our Lord. There was a time when our Lord was crucified, Him in the center were the two thieves. They were considered criminals, as it was written by St. Luke, where they were also led away to death with Jesus. And when they came up to the place called the skull, 
There was also that man who apparently was a soldier. He scoffed or mocked our Lord, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, he must be the chosen one. So, this was something very hard for our Lord Jesus to hear. The rulers, the soldiers, were there to undermine, to mock our Lord. It would have been more understandable for those people because they didn't have faith. They didn't recognize actually our Lord as God. Or little have they learned about our Lord. But what was, uh, what was more surprising was that there were two thieves. They were public sinners, for which these two fellows walked together with Jesus, also suffering because they were also carrying their crosses. But look at the attitude of these two fellows. When they were there hanging on the cross, the three of them, our Lord in the center, someone who felt entitled, told our Lord, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. On the other hand, there was the other thief, whose name in some other books said that his name was Demas. He was the one who rebuked his fellow thief. And he said, Do you not fear God since you are the, on the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. And he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And then there, were the words of our Lord, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. My dear listeners, the heart of Jesus what must have been going on with that heart? He must be suffering physically and tremendously emotionally because just as this soldier 
who didn't have any qualm at all, mocked him, it would have been more understandable than that thief who started mocking our Lord despite the fact that he was a thief, a sinner. As I've said a while ago, it's very unfortunate that some people, when they suffer here on earth, they think that they don't deserve at all such difficulties. They even sometimes put the blame on others and they do not see upon themselves the reasons why they suffer because what was in their head what's in their head is that that person believe that it deserves special treatment or recognition for something that he does not earn. That is, in fact, the general definition of a person who feels so entitled, a person with a sense of entitlement. He believes that such a treatment, especially when this kind of bad treatment is, is experienced, he would say, that should not be for me. Well, this, which we can already say, unrepentant thief, bad enough that he was a thief, but he does not recognize his guilt. My dear friends of God, in this season of Lent, let us avoid that kind of sense of entitlement. It is a time for us to ponder deeply upon our heart. Instead of mocking God, blaming Him for our difficulties and challenges in this world, we might as well think that we deserve such difficulties. After all, we know that our Lord, on the other hand, is assuming upon himself the sins of the world despite the fact that he himself was sinless or is sinless. Our Lord, having no sin, did not so feel entitled to think or to say, I don't care. But rather, he assumed it, he assumed sin, so that he may also suffer with us. But this fellow, a guilty fellow, condemned also to die on the cross, did not even move his heart to ask Jesus for his forgiveness. He even forced upon Jesus, if you are the Savior, you are the Christ, so save yourself and save us too. What kind of an entitlement is that? But look, the thief, the good thief, on the other hand, he was very apologetic. And in fact, he even defended our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the beautiful thing about that. He was a sinner, but in the process of 
short conversation, our Lord Jesus Christ realized that this man, after all, was trying to show his repugnance for the sins committed, and then for the atonement of his sins, and then third, he was asking for forgiveness. When he said, we deserve this, this good thing was saying, we deserve this punishment. Isn't it just like saying that he deserved the punishment being a thief? But in his helplessness, he looks upon Jesus for mercy and compassion. We must be like that too. Every time that we go to confession, isn't it that we are acting like the good thief? The paradox that we can say, the good sinner, because having sinned, we go to tell God that we are guilty of our sins. And then we tell God also that we deserve the corresponding punishment, but still hopeful of God's mercy. You know, the good thief in this story uh, is so amazing because he sensed actually the horror of sin, the horror of going to hell. Because he said, remember me when thou comest into your kingdom. He was not simply thinking that anyway, I'll die, I'm going to die here and I'm going to rot here on the cross. No. The mind of the good thief being repentant and atoning for his sins, for the guilt that he confessed to our Lord when he said, we are thieves, we deserve this. He was also hopeful of the mercy of Jesus. That's why he said, remember me, Lord, remember me. It's so beautiful, no? That word, memento, remember. I should say that uh, when we go to confession, when we say our sins, what is striking is that when we say our sins, our guilt, God forgets our sins and he will only remember the good act of asking mercy from him. That's the most beautiful thing of it. Uh, we have heard sometimes, you know, if uh, somebody had offended us, sometimes people would say, okay, come on, forget it. Forget it. And since we're the ones offended, we have a hard time sometimes to forget. But don't you know that the mercy of God, when we go to the sacrament of the confession, we utter our words of guilt, automatically God forgets those sins because why because of his mercy this is how for example our Lord when he was there hanging on the cross our Lord knew exactly the sins of this good thief but immediately he forgets those and what remains in his mind is the petition of the guy who says, Remember me when thou comes into your kingdom. And our Lord surely remembers that more than his sins. That's why, beautifully, our Lord said, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That kind of remembrance of our Lord is now 
established and definitively uttered by our Lord, you will be with me today in paradise. It is very, very similar to on how we hear in, through the mouth of the priests, and of course it's our Lord God who forgives, he would say, and I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's what we hear in the sacrament of confession. So we have to tell our Lord here, Lord, may I be like the good thief. May I snatch paradise from you. May I be like the good thief who can steal paradise from you. Because Lord, we know that you can easily forget our sins as long as we acknowledge that in front of you and we do not feel entitled about that. But Father, in your mercy, we are very hopeful that you will always remember us, especially on the moment of our death. You will remember us so that we can go to paradise with you as well. May the blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross give us that sense of peace while we acknowledge our sinfulness, a sense of peace that our Lord will always remember us, most especially in the hour of our death, so that we will be there in paradise. Jesus, with your divine mercy, always remember us. Amen. Let's all kneel. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations that you have communicated to me in this meditation. I beg your help in performing them. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In this traditional devotion during Holy Week of meditating on the seven last words of Jesus on the cross, we reach now the third expression of Jesus, full of hope and tenderness. Woman, behold your son, behold your mother. Mary is the woman announced by God after the original sin of Adam and Eve. She is the one who will give birth to the new Adam, Jesus, who crushed the head of the devil. Consequently, this third sentence of Jesus on the cross fills us all with hope. We belong now, by the will of Jesus, to the family of God. The previous two words of Jesus on the cross are words of forgiveness and of salvation. This third word, making us children of Mary, brothers of Jesus and members of God's, God's household, is a word of relationship. Saint Jose Maria Escrivá, who meditated often on Mary at the foot of the cross, explains, rather, he wrote, in Christ is passing by, number 140. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, brought Mary into his home, into his life. Spiritual writers have seen these words of the Gospel as an invitation 
to all Christians to bring Mary into their lives. Mary certainly wants us to invoke her, to approach her confidently, to appeal to her as our mother, asking her to show that you are our mother. Then these words of Saint Jose Maria, these tender expressions, uh, in them we see several steps for us to grow in relationship with Mary and through her with Jesus and the whole Blessed Trinity. To invoke her, to approach her confidently, to appeal to her and to ask her. This is the way children do with their mothers. They call, they approach, they draw near and they talk to their mothers seeking signs of their motherly affection. But one starting point of this filial relationship with Mary is above all to be aware of the compassionate glance of our Heavenly Mother. Images of Our Lady in our churches and in our homes are very helpful, not just as objects of decoration, but as reminders and even more icons of the constant glance of the Mother of Jesus and ours. Now, a bit of pause for reflection and examination may be of great help to us. Am I aware of the glance of Mary to me, to you, all the time? Do I consider Mary as someone really close to me? There is no need of expecting miraculous apparitions which really happen when God wants and these apparitions are to humble people. Those apparitions are just the tip of the iceberg. But the power given by God to Mary, she is looking at each one of us all the time, especially by means of her images. Just think of the glance of Our Lady from her image of Guadalupe. In a mysterious manner, when the Church blessed the images of Our Lady, making them object of devotion, those images become instruments which facilitate our relationship with God through Mary. In the miraculous image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, we even through science, we discover how really Mary is looking, looking at us from that image. True devotion unite us with God. Devotion, as act of the virtue of religion, is prompt willingness to serve God. We are eager to serve God, especially when we are prompted by the loving glance of our mother, like little children. When they see their mothers looking at them, they become more aware, they, be, they behave better. Why? Because they are aware. My mother is looking at me. Am I aware that Mary is looking at me? Because Jesus, who is all-powerful, gave her to us as mother, and she is now in the eternity of God with the eternal power, the great power of God, and she can be everywhere, and he, she can look at everyone. To finish these considerations, based on the third, third word of Jesus on the cross, which is, woman, behold your son, behold your mother. Mary is really beholding us, is watching over us. Then, as we consider this third word, we pray a popular prayer to Mary, very well known, very much used in South America especially, this prayer at the end of is, is a filial request, an expansion of this aspiration, monstrate se matrem, very much loved by Saint Jose Maria, show that you are our mother. This South American prayer goes, sweet mother, do not stay away, keep watch on me both night and day. Come with me wherever I go, and never ever leave me alone. Since you most truly are my mother, 
Please protect me like no other. Get me the blessing I need most from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Mother, Mama Mary, for watching always over all of us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I beg your pardon for my sins. The grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. We are going to contemplate the fourth word of our Lord. Our Lord being crucified, he said, My Lord, my Lord, why have you abandoned me? is the fourth word of abandonment. Abandon or forsake in other tra tra translations means to withdraw from. Well, looks like his father has withdrawn from him, has abandoned him. How could it be? <clears throat> to begin to understand this, we have to realize that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. He never stopped being God before the foundation of the world until the end. He began to exist in the mode, put it this way, of man as a human when he was born of the Virgin Mary. Now the cross is him, God, the second person, the Blessed Trinity, who is being crucified in his humanity. Of course, as God, he cannot be crucified or suffer, but he's also man. In his humanity, he suffer. Eli, Eli, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he's saying it. It's not that he was pretending. To begin to understand this, I was telling you, we have to go deep into that. He's, but not just any man. By being God and man at the same time, he assumed, that is, he took upon his shoulders all the sins, imperfections of humanity, of all people, of all times. That's what he was carrying on his shoulder to the cross, including my sins, your sins. That's why when a person is besieged with temptation, that person should think, oh, just a minute, just a minute. Am I ready? Am I willing to load our Lord Jesus again? That's why they say, whoever commits a mortal sin, he has crucified Jesus again. Jesus is crucified. So at that moment, that person should think, am I willing to crucify Jesus? Simply, 
this is what is happening. Jesus hangs on the cross, despite suffering, dying. His Father God loved him with an immense love, and yet he did not spare him from this suffering. Also, it has to be understood on the context of sacrifice. Mankind has to offer a sacrifice to God, but who could offer a sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice? a perfect victim with a perfect intention. No one of us, only Jesus, the Lamb of God, could offer himself as a sacrifice. That's why that Lamb, Jesus Christ, is symbolically speaking, is loaded with our sins and therefore not just symbolically, but in such a way that he suffered the consequences of it. One thing is to say, well, I'm sorry, my brother did not commit that crime. It was me. Yes, but what about the consequences? Are you willing to be condemned for perhaps 30 years jail. So the Lord not only appeared there in the name of all mankind, taking your sins and my sins, but suffering the consequences. His pain was real. He suffered pain for you, for me. What are we going to say? That's the meaning of it. Why have you abandoned me? So his Father God made him taste or allow him to suffer the punishment that really corresponded to us. It should be our. Now, at this moment, we have to think for oh, just a minute. If Jesus is suffering for me, for my sins, what can I do for him? How can I correspond? Well, first of all, not committing a sin ever again, thinking it over and over when we suffer a temptation, because as I was telling you, is to crucify, a mortal, commit a mortal sin is to crucify Jesus again. And second, we have to react with gratitude. Thank you, Lord. You have erased my sin. You have taken the punishment that should be mine you suffered that abandonment. Thank you, Lord. Never go away from me, and I will never go away from you. You see, these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? It's not pleasant. It's a, it's a word full of despair. In fact, it was misunderstood by the people close by, and they thought he was calling Elijah, because Eli in the Aramaic, not in Hebrew, but in Aramaic, means my God. Nowadays, very often, the Lord is misunderstood, exactly as it happened on the cross, not different, even worse. He's misunderstood. That's why you and I, together with that gratitude, we have to promise that commitment to, to speak of Jesus, to make him known, to spread his love. But also there is finally hope in this fourth word. Hope in the promise of God's deliverance because that awareness, Eli, Eli, my God, my God, he is my God. So I may not understand why I am suffering this moment of despair, but he still is my God, and he will never stop being so and being infinitely compassionate and merciful. Therefore, within that despair, there is a bright beam of light at the end of the tunnel. He will never stop being my God. I can never think that this abandonment is forever. 
It's a punishment that I deserve, but not forever. With this last word, we are invited to do likewise in our life, to atone for the sins of the other, but most of all, to depend on God, to trust in His love, in His love, to believe that eternal life is offered to us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Is God offering us when we are committed to Christ? We don't leave Him alone. And there you go. There you go. I, I, I cannot go. No, joining Him. We should pray that Christ's life and death may become the model and motivation for our own life, our own self-giving commitment. Only if we do so, we deserve the name of winners, of conqueror, not of loser. The reason Christ is not a loser, he is a conqueror for life and death. For him, and also for us, death will be changed into life. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations you have communicated to me in this meditation. I beg your help in performing them. May Maculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Let us open the Gospel of St. John as we continue our reflections on the seven last words of our Lord. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. We cannot uh, read this, this passage, these lines, without being moved with a lot of gratitude to our Lord. Our Lord is here in the tabernacle. We are reflecting his last moments here on earth. And we have the, uh, a crucifix behind the tabernacle to help us in our reflection. A reflection that is full of gratitude. Thank you, Lord for all the sufferings you have undergone in order to save me. We are going to reflect, to focus specifically on the words, I thirst. You know, the, the last time that our Lord drank properly was still during the Last Supper. That's, that's more than 18 hours ago. You know, if you have not drunk for 18 hours or more, you will be very, very thirsty, even if you are not doing anything. Um, but those 18 hours were full of, of many events, uh, not, not only physical uh, sufferings because of lack of sleep or, or whatever, but, but also because of many betrayals. It, it began with the betrayal of Judas there in Gethsemane. And then he was, he was brought, mishandled, arrested to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest at the time. 
so that the Sanhedrin could try him, even in the late, late in the evening or practically midnight or I don't know what time exactly. It was a very weird trial. Do, do you have a trial in the court at, at that time? Everybody should be asleep at that time. But since this was a, a mock trial, they had to fabricate witnesses, fabricate pieces of evidence. Uh, it, it was done like uh, in the dark, literally. And even in that place, our Lord suffered another betrayal by Peter by the very person whom he trusted to be his, his right-hand man, to be, his, uh, to be the leader of the church, of his church, the Prince of the Apostles. And then he had to wait. He was imprisoned. He had to wait for the following day. Uh, they had to bring him to the civil power, to Pilate, in order to be tried. And when, when they brought him to Pilate, Pilate sent him to Herod, he rode back to Pilate. We are very familiar with what happened. Flagellations, a lot of flagellations, crowning with thorns. You know, when our Lord appeared to St. Saint, Saint, uh, Gertrude, uh, he revealed that he had 5,466 wounds. 5,466 wounds. How can, you, how can you fit that in, in, in the surface area of a human body? It, that means every square centimeter has wounds. We cannot but, but be very grateful to our Lord for being willing to sacrifice himself even in that way, that, that very painful way, showing how genuine his love is and how unconditional his love is. He loves us even if he had to go through that. It's, it's unconditional. It's, it's unlimited. And you can imagine the blood loss. The perspiration, definitely, but the blood loss. Uh, so that's why when he was already brought from the praetorium, when he was condemned, the cross was given to him, to Calvary, which was not a very far distance. Uh, it, it's not very far. But he barely made it to Calvary. He fell three times. And soon after, he will die. Uh, that the two thieves died. Well, he was he was still uh, he was when he was dead. They were still alive. The two, the two thieves, because the two thieves did not suffer as much as our Lord. When our Lord was is, was there hanging on the cross, every breath he took was really very agonizing, and it's good also to remember at this time uh, those who have died of COVID. Uh, not too long ago, many people were in the ICU. Some did not make it. We pray for them. Some made it. Those who made it, they, they, they said that uh, having the severe case of COVID, uh, they, were, they were like drowning. And every breath that they took was, was with a lot of effort. They had to be in the prone position, breathing for six hours, breathing all the time, of course, no? To breathe in that condition for, for one hour, for six hours, 12 hours, 48 hours, was really very difficult. But of course, in the case of our Lord, it was even worse because our Lord was full of wounds. When you look at the shroud, you will realize how, how many wounds, how, how bloody it was. When you watch uh, The Passion of the Christ, which is already very violent, but the reality was even more so. Look at the, look at the shroud. It's, 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 it's worse than, than what is portrayed in The Passion of the Christ. And there our Lord is hanging on the cross, saying, I thirst. The thirst of our Lord was not only physical. Obviously, it was physical. But it was more than that. There's a book entitled, What Jesus Saw from the Cross. You know, God became man. He lived with us. Of course, we did not give him a decent birthplace. The house that he had was 30, around 36 square meters only. The food that he ate, 
the the clothes that he wore we are not really very uh, we are not uh, very welcoming hosts to the god who became man after all those years after doing so many good things miracles teachings etc now he is hanging on the cross where did this all lead up to what happened was it worthwhile all of this now he says i thirst you know there's another episode in the life of our lord and i would like to connect it there because it will give us clearly the different kinds of thirst that our lord already experienced before so there was one moment one day when he was walking from Judea to Galilee. So that's, that's far, that's more than 60 kilometers. He passed through Samaria on the way to Galilee. And that's where he met the Samaritan woman. He sat in the well of Jacob. So it's a very nice thing to imagine. Our Lord tired of the journey. He sat down beside the well, wanting to drink water, obviously. There comes a Samaritan woman, also thirsty, wanting to drink water. But there are different kinds of thirst. This woman was thirsty physically, but he was also thirsty in another way. She was looking for the true love. In fact, she tried several times. She already had five husbands. And the, the one that she had at that moment when she was talking with our Lord was already the sixth. She was looking for the right one. The person, the love that will quench her thirsts. That will give meaning to her life. Fortunately, our Lord came. And fortunately, our Lord is offering the living water. Let us, let us, look at the, let us listen to the description of our Lord of the living water whoever drinks the water i shall give will never thirst the water i shall give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life so here two thirsty persons jesus christ and the woman two different kinds of thirsts physical thirsts and spiritual thirsts moral thirsts and here our Lord is offering to the woman, I give you the living water so that you will not be thirsty again. And the woman, she left her jar. It's an external sign that she's accepting that she is taking the living water. Later on, this woman will become Saint Photina. Photina means photos, photos, the lighted one. She will become a martyr. Her children, well, she had some children from... From some men will become martyrs as well and because and that happened that began with the encounter in Jacob's well and there you will see what the thirst of Jesus is Jesus was thirsty for the reciprocation of the love of God to man so God loves men but men must love him in return that's what he was thirsty for. He is thirsty for your love. He is thirsty for your conversion. He is thirsty for your, love, for your salvation. And that's why on the cross he says, I thirst. You, you remember when he was looking at Jerusalem, he said, and he cried, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how much I long to gather you as a mother, as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you would not that kind of longing that kind of thirst he is on the cross he is longing for the love of men on that cross he was very thirsty because there was no love there was very little love his apostles abandoned him the people who received so much so many good things from him betrayed him abandoned him mocked him he was very thirsty you and me what are we going to give him are we like the roman soldiers who will give him sour wine no since he is longing for love we will give him our love well the thing is 
His love, the love that He showed us, is full of sacrifices because true love is equal to sacrifices. There is no true love without sacrifices. He loves us so much that He had undergone, He was willing to undergo all those sufferings. Now it's our turn. Do we love our Lord so much that we are willing to sacrifice for Him? Let us give Him that love so that He will not be thirsty, so that we can quench His thirst. But not only that, He is not only thirsty for your love, singular, you as one, but also you, plural, mankind. That means if we want to give, to give Him a lot of water, spiritual water, if we want to quench His thirst, let us give Him a lot of loves from different people, co-redemption, apostolate. Let us co-redeem with our Lord. Souls, apostolic souls, they are for you, Saint Jose Maria once wrote in the way. Let us resolve to love God more, ready to sacrifice ourselves. Let us also resolve to do a lot of apostolate in order to quench the thirst of our Lord there hanging on the cross. I thirst, Lord, here we have the love, our own love, and the love of many other people to quench your thirst. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, I welcome you to our consideration of the seven last words. Today we will take a look, meditate on the sixth word of Jesus. St. John tells us that from the cross, just before his death, our Lord said, it is consummated. He is also translated as, it is accomplished, it is finished. In a consideration of these words, I would like to begin with a story that St. Jose Maria himself related about an event that happened to him many years ago. I have the account right here. He wrote, One day, I was with a friend of mine a man with a good heart, but who did not have faith. Pointing towards a globe, he said, look, from north to south, from east to west. What do you want me to look at? I asked. His answer was, the failure of Christ. Look at the failure of Christ. For 20 centuries, people have been trying to bring his doctrine to men's lives. And look at the result. I was filled with sadness, St. Jose Maria wrote. It is painful to think that many people still do not know our Lord and that among those who know him, Many live as though they did not. But that feeling lasted only a moment. It was shortly overcome by love and thankfulness because Jesus has wanted every man to cooperate in the work of redemption. He has not failed. Jesus has not failed. On the contrary, from the cross, he says precisely, it is consummated, it is accomplished, it is finished. 
But what exactly was our Lord referring to here? What did he accomplish at the cross? What did he finish? The Gospels tell us exactly what our Lord was referring to. The mission of Christ, why he became man, is something that the Gospels have always repeated. Mark, for example, tells us Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of John, quoting John the Baptist, who said, The Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. The Gospel of Luke tells us that the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. That clearly is the mission of Christ, to give his life, to save us from our sins. And this is what we call the redemption. So with the death of our Lord, with his impending death from the cross, he would say these words, it is accomplished, it is consummated, it is finished. The redemption of man from our sins is fulfilled. It is clearly a shout of victory. Our Lord on the cross was announcing his victory. It is a cry of accomplishment. It is also an announcement of obedience fulfilled. Christ was not just doing a good thing that he could give his life to. Yes, certainly our redemption is a good thing, but that is that was the very will of his father God and he had also come to accomplish it so when he said it is accomplished it is not just our redemption but the very will of his father that was fulfilled it was the culmination of a life of humility of suffering certainly but also of obedience. Christ on the cross had fulfilled his mission. But he wanted us to receive this grace of our redemption freely. Our Father God wanted us to receive this as free children. And so while Christ has accomplished for us this grace, we must take it upon our lives. We must freely receive it. And so the work of the redemption is still being carried out. While it is certainly sufficient, the death of Christ was enough. It is certainly sufficient, but it is still ongoing not that the death of christ was not enough it is sufficient as we said but that has to be applied to each one of us we have to freely accept it and so as saint jose maria said the work of salvation is still going on and each one of us has a part in it our part is actually very clear Jesus loved us, he died on the cross, we must love him in return. As St. Jose Maria also said, Christ died on the cross for you. You, what would you do for Christ? Die, die to our sins, receive that grace, be part of the victory of our Lord from the cross. And we can say and we can share truly in that work of redemption. From the cross, our Lord announces a victory. And it is for us to share. Saint Jose Maria also 
tells us, I read his words, let us meditate on our Lord, wounded from head to foot out of love for us. This is what we can see when we look at the cross. Using a phrase which approaches the truth, although it does not express its full reality, we can repeat the words of an ancient writer. The body of Christ is a portrait in pain. At the sight of Christ, bruised and broken, just a lifeless body taken down from the cross and given to his mother, at the sight of Jesus destroyed in this way, we might have thought that he failed. He failed utterly. Where are the people who followed him? Where is the kingdom that he foretold? But no, the death of Jesus is precisely his victory. It is not a defeat. With the death of Christ, we are nearer the resurrection than ever before. We are going to see the triumph which he has won with his obedience. So let this then be an invitation. St. Jose Maria also says, The divine message of victory should be the unshakable foundation for every Christian's way of thinking and acting and living. We cannot live as if Christ has not died or that Christ has succeeded in our redemption. That is his victory. We can share in it. We just want, we just must wish to want it. Let us receive it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I beg your pardon for my sins and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Well, we have uh, come to the uh, last word of uh, this Good Friday, which we have started all the way from the uh, have been listening, have been uh, uh, meditating, have been uh, bringing uh, our uh, reflection on those words that are still very, very fresh the, that we have listened. It's a, a long sort of reflection, commentaries of uh, different priests. And uh, well, this is the two round, round up, you know, that this is the last, and we are uh, about to thank the Lord and say, well, yes, uh, this is the, as far as what we could contribute in uh, helping people listening to your last words already on the cross, on the crucifixion. And uh, surely our Lord is having a difficult time breathing and hurting very much with all the wounds all over the body. And uh, that's what's amazing to you, Lord, that in spite of that, you surely 
made an effort uh, not to waste those few minutes you have there. Or, well, you were there a long time and you were able to say one uh, word to the other. And uh, there, no, if uh, I, I might repeat, no, how you have said, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And the next one that you are saying to the good thief is saying, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And then the next would be looking at Mary was there and said, woman, behold thy son, behold your mother. You have given uh, her to us up to now. We can call on, on her. And the next one is when you're looking up and say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the next one is looking at the people, very few, I thirst. Not because uh, water, but rather, where are the people? I came to save everybody. I thirst for souls. I want all, everybody. It's done. Second to the last, it is finished. I am done. God is already about to give, uh, not give up, meaning the body cannot resist anymore. It's almost uh, the last uh, uh, breath, the last few bre bre breath that he has. It is finished. I'm done. And my reflection in these uh, seven last words, siete palabras that we say, would be, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. So I is looking up and say, here am I, and uh, I have commit, Father, my spirit. It's yours. From beginning of the incarnation to the redemption at Good Friday, today, that he will give up. I am yours. Our Lord was just ordered by God the Father to come down, to carry out the, this uh, salvific mission with a lot of preparation until that time that it's, it's him uh, to, to be incarnated with Mary and Joseph and for all those years, not really very many, uh, more than mine, more than many others. If we pass 33 years old, then we are uh, older than Jesus. But Jesus just yes, spent 33 years to accomplish his mission to be the Savior, uh, to be the Redemptor, to be the one going to pay for the debts of our sin. And... Uh, it's accomplished. I commit into your hands my spirit. I am yours. So it's that as if I am done and I am going back to you. He was out to carry out. Now he is back to the Father. And uh, the what we could say in here and what we could think about will be, uh, wow, perfect, because God is perfect, Jesus is perfect man and perfect God, we are imperfect, we are sinful when we came to the world with our first parents, and as a consequence, all of us are sinners, but we have to carry out a mission our Lord created us so that we can be sharers of His kingdom. He wants that we be reunited, but for the meantime, I throw you down there through your parents and you uh, in the womb of your mother, and then you, uh, uh, your birth, uh, and then we grew. No, no, the many years of childhood, adolescence, and then the adulthood, and all the while, maybe at that age where we are looking 
what do I want to be spend the rest of my life? What profession? What work? What state? Married, celibate, religious, lay people. So that is because that's part of how we will go back to where we are supposed to end. It's a trip. It's a pilgrimage. It's a journey from beginning, coming into the world, and we don't know how long. Some people are very short. Some in just, just the middle. Some after senior. Some really up to 80, 90. Whichever fortune we have gotten, only the Lord would know. But what is important is that at the end, like our Lord, one day, one year after another, He was fulfilling the will of His Father God. Everything is moving towards that end. Even when he was just very ordinary child growing and helping uh, uh, St. Joseph you know, in his workshop as a carpenter, he was a son of a carpenter and for many years he spent that, not wasting time, but simply it's part of what he has to do, part of the plan of God. And so with us, with me, knowingly and i'm sure each one of us would have would have to know what then should i accomplish using this as a material lord this is what you have given me as a priest many years back almost 40 years for the others as professional doctors engineers businessmen whatever because that's the course you have taken and then you got married you have children you have family and you have a lot of work and that's how you spend the time given. Could we, at the end, already looking forward that I am about to arrive? Our Lord also has arrived to, uh, to the station of the cross, carrying the cross, being uh, then nailed to the cross, crucified, and dying at the last moment. And the last word, that he uttered was, Father, I commend my spirit. I am yours, reuniting. That's the idea. I want to reunite. I, I will leave everything here that the, I have done. And of course, if we know that this could be the materials of materials that we would bring to our Father God and say, this is how I spend my life. And this is what you want me to do as a priest or as a professional or as a father, as a mother. This is how I want to come back and be reunited with you. Could we? We make a little reflection. Could it be said of us that we are going back and be reunited with the Lord happily, joyfully, eagerly, wanting to go home. Not really uh, as soon as possible because maybe I still have a mission. I can still stay healthy and in the few years that I will be here, I carry on my pastoral work, I can help many souls, I can uh, absolve many in the sacrament of uh, penance, I can uh, say the Mass every day and be of help to the others, including myself. And that way, when the time comes, Lord, when you call me and He calls us, that is also the same thing we will say. Now, I want to reunite myself. I commend everything to you. Pause for a while. Think that we are at Calvary. Crucifixion. Our Lord will close his eyes. Stop breathing. And from the cross, 
he will be brought down in the arms of his mother Mary and to be reunited soon and to resurrect in three days as he promised. Lord, this is also what we would request. That from now on, the last word that you said would also be sticking to our mind, thinking that it would be any day. That's why we are preparing all the time. This Good Friday, next Good Friday, if we have extended life for um, some more years, then we will prepare all the time, carry out. But when the time comes, then happily we will be looking for you and we'll say like the, the last word of Jesus saying, I commend my spirit, I offer my body and my soul. I want to be with you in heaven forever and forever. I want to be with Saint Osa Maria, Blessed Alvaro, Blessed Guadalupe, and all the people that we know, all the saints. That's it. Done. And then we also close our eyes and stop breathing, and there you are. We open our eyes. The reward is being given to us, isn't it? It would be very, very happy moments. If we want to have that, the last, uh, the last minute, then let's continue preparing. Well, we ask you, Lord, to help us carry on uh, this cross, these uh, trials, this uh, pandemic, or whatever difficulties we would have, and to carry it up, up to the summit, up to the end of our life, arriving to you and joining you in heaven. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, inspirations that you have communicated to me in this meditation. I beg your help in performing them. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Most Holy Mother of Sorrows, by that soul-piercing martyrdom that deeds undergo at the foot of the cross during the three hours agony of Jesus, thine to assist me also, who am the child of thy sorrows in my agony, so that by thine intercession I may be found worthy to pass from my dead bed to thy blessed Society in Paradise. From a sudden and unprovided death, deliver us, O Lord. From the snares of the devil, deliver us, O Lord. From everlasting death, deliver us, O Lord. Let us pray. O God, who for the salvation of mankind has made for us in the most bitter death of thy Son both an example and a refuge. Grant we beseech thee that we may be found worthy to obtain the fruit of his great love in our final peril at the hour of death and to be made partakers of our Redeemer's glory through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God.